Hello, good people. I want to turn to a topic today that we have taught throughout the years, only in bits and pieces, on the Jesus trip, but uh, extensively in our conferences and our mystical schools. And my new book, Cosmos Reborn, goes into this very extensively. I want to touch, kind of in a, a little 20 minute nutshell here, this twisted doctrine of penal substitution. Now, again, you've heard lots of teaching from us here, but I just want to sum this up as best as possible because this is like a big elephant that's been in the room for a long time in the church that nobody really wants to address, nobody really wants to deal with. And it's this major foundational crack in our understanding about the nature of God. Moses, uh, he asked God, he says, show me your glory. And then it says the goodness of God passed in front of him. So what that tells me is God's goodness and his glory are the same thing. So anytime we don't recognize how good God actually is, we are going to experience a glory deficit. We are not going to be aware of his presence. And I'm telling you, any area in your theological system where you haven't recognized how good God is, you are going to be messed up. And this is a very, very big doctrine in so many evangelical churches, in the Roman Catholic churches, although the, the Eastern Orthodox churches, they never quite bought off on this stuff. But nevertheless, this is a, a, a major thing. It's this idea that, you know, here's God in the beginning. Adam goes and he does the unthinkable. He eats God's fruit. And you don't just eat God's fruit. Somebody has to pay for that apple. And so God in his bloodlust, in his holy wrath, because God is love, but God is wrath, as if that's a verse in the Bible. God is good, but God is just, as if those are two equal opposite attributes of his character. God has to appease his anger. His justice has to be served. And so his bloodlust, he comes down raging like a thunderbolt from the sky, like Thor with his hammer. Somebody has to pay for that apple. Veins bulging out of the side of his head, face as red as a beet. He's coming down to open up a can on you. And then all of a sudden, Jesus steps in, good cop, bad cop. And instead of destroying you, he takes it out on his son. And that's the good news, that God really, really hated you, but he decided to massacre his own son instead. And if you say this prayer, he'll decide to love you. Now, I think this is a little bit twisted. And this is where we get to this mainline doctrine of penal substitution. We have this idea that Jesus, bless his little heart, he went through a lot, you know, he's working, 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 praying, 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 preaching, 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 working his little fingers to the bone, endured a lot of bad stuff here on planet Earth. But the one thing that he was really not looking forward to was when he took the sins of the world upon himself and the Father was going to turn his back on the Son. And here we have Mark 15, 34, Matthew 27, 46, about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Let me make this crystal, crystal clear. The Father never, ever, ever, ever forsook the Son. Jesus did not say, my God, you have forsaken me. No, he asked a question. Why? He was asking your question. The question you ask when you feel forsaken by a God who never forsakes anybody. So you have to understand, when Jesus came into the incarnation, he did not just come as a superman. He wasn't just clicking his fingers and turning the oceans of the world into Kool-Aid. When Jesus stepped into the incarnation, he came, Paul says, in the guise of sinful humanity. Now, he never committed a sin once in his life, but he stepped into the same limitations that you and I face as sinful human beings. He wasn't just doing calculus algorithms at age two. He, he, he grew in favor and wisdom with God and man. He grew up 
And he grew up into his calling and into an understanding of God. He grew up just like we grew up. He stepped into a self-imposed limitation. And on the cross, he stepped into the full depth of our psychological calamity when we are blind to the goodness of God. You see, Jesus on the cross, the Father was not turning his back on Jesus. The Father wasn't blind to us or blind to Jesus because he was too holy. No, Jesus was stepping into our blindness to the goodness of God. See, if you think that on the cross the Trinity was imploding on itself, that the Father was, was turning away and rejecting the Son. Look, if the Father turned his back on us or the Son of the world, we would evaporate in less than a second. The Trinity was not imploding on itself on the cross. Matter of fact, the cross was the full expression of the love of the entire Trinity. If you think the Trinity was turning on itself, then you're going to have quite a bit of a problem with the Scriptures. And I have a few of them right here. For instance, John 10, verse 30, Jesus says, I and my Father are one. That was never temporarily suspended on the cross. John 14, 11, he says, Believe me when I say I am in the Father and the Father is in me. The Father didn't jump out of Jesus on the cross. John 6, 46, No one has seen the Father except the one who is from God. The word also means with God. Only he has seen the Father. Jesus was from God and always with the Father. He was from heaven and always in heaven. In heaven on earth. That was always the case. John 16, 32, he's saying to the disciples, he says, you guys will leave me all alone, yet I am not alone. What's he talking about when he went to the cross? You'll leave me all alone, yet I am not alone, for my Father is with me. And of course, 2 Corinthians 5, 19, to wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the cosmos to himself. John 8, 28 and 29, Jesus says, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, whenever he talks about being lifted up, he meant being lifted up on the cross. Just as Moses lifted the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. He says, when you have lifted up the Son of Man on the cross, then you will know that I am he, that I do nothing on my own, but speak just what the Father has taught me. The one who has sent me is with me. He has not left me alone. We have this idea that the Father had to turn his back on us, that the Father was too holy. I mean, doesn't the Scripture say that, that his eyes are too pure to look on evil? Let me tell you something. God was never, ever, ever your enemy. That's right. You get that, it's going to change your Christianity. God was never your enemy. We have this idea, oh, but brother... We were in enmity with God in our sins. Colossians 1, 21 and 22. Once you were alienated from God and you were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. But now he has reconciled us through Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. But wasn't the Father too pure to look upon our sins? See, we're okay for Jesus to step down and for him to take the sins of the world upon himself. It's okay for Jesus to hang out with mafioso tax collectors and prostitutes, hookers, and, and bad, you know, hooligans. Because, of course, Jesus is not as holy as the Father, right? Which is to say he's not God, which is to say you're not a Christian. Maybe we're a little mixed up on this. Doesn't the scriptures say that he can't look upon evil. It does say that. Why don't we read it in context? Habakkuk 1.13 says, Your eyes are too pure to look on evil. You cannot tolerate wrong. So why then are you doing it? Maybe what we're dealing with here is Habakkuk's own misunderstanding of the nature of God. Why are you silent when the wicked swallow up those more righteous than themselves? Why then do you tolerate the treacherous? We are dealing with Habakkuk's own misunderstanding, just like Adam misunderstood the nature of God. Adam running away, hiding in the bushes, trying to pull away from relationship out of fear and rejection and insecurity. And so some of you will say, well, wasn't there a sin problem that needed to be dealt with? Wasn't there this separation that had to be dealt with? Well, there was a separation that needed to be dealt with. 
Isaiah 59, 1 and 2 says, Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor his ear too dull to hear, but your iniquities have separated you from your God, your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. You see, your sin separated you from God, but your sin never separated God from you. Where are you going to run from a God who's everywhere? Where are you going to go? Where are you going to hide? You see, sin caused us to pull away. Like Adam, it caused us to retreat, us to hide away, us to look for a place where God was not. Our sin separated us from God. It did not separate God from us. Now, this is not just wordplay. This is not just mere semantics. This is the difference between gospel or no gospel. This is a difference between a God of love and a God of narcissism and self-importance and distance and withdrawal. No, it is a loving Father. See, the problem here is that the church, unfortunately, does not believe in the Trinity. Now, of course, we give lip service to the Trinity, but what the church really believes in is demon, son, and holy Bible. Let me tell you, the real Trinity is a loving Father manifest through the Son and the power of a very real and tangible Holy Ghost. Amen? So, what happens here is people get really confused because all of a sudden, they don't even know what the cross is about anymore. If the cross was not about paying off some retributive God, if it was not about paying off some angry deity, we have this idea that Jesus was twisting God's arm to love us, that he was trying to condition God to love us, but his love is unconditional. We think Jesus was trying to condition the Father to be gracious to us, but his grace is unconditional. So what is the point of the blood? We don't even know why the blood was spilled. We have this idea that it was some pagan Indiana Jones in the Temple of Doom human sacrifice must need blood, like like Molech or Baal. What was the point of the blood if it was not to pay off an angry father and just have some big legal exchange in the sky? What was the point of the blood? Hebrews 10, 22. Why the sprinkled blood? Was it to appease an angry God? It says, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart And with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us of a guilty conscience. The blood was not for him. Have you ever figured uh, it was his blood, right? The blood was not for him. The blood was for you. The early church never believed this ridiculous idea that Jesus was dying to save you from God. (laughs) But all of a sudden, what do we have? We have this massive monkey wrench that's thrown into the cog work of our theological system because we don't know what the cross was about. We have this idea that on the cross, Jesus was dying to save us from some other God, that behind his back is some dark side of God, some angry God, some vicious side of God. But let me tell you that to see Jesus is to see the full love of the Father. It is to see the full expression of the love of the Trinity. But we have this idea that Jesus on the cross was twisting God's arm, that he was trying to change God's mind towards you, but God does not need changing. On the cross, Jesus was not changing God. On the cross, Jesus was changing God you. He stepped into the depths of your depravity, into the depths of your alienation, your separation, your depravity, your corruption. He stepped into your anxiety, your fear, your desperation, your hard-headed wrongness, your resistance, your rebellion, your rejection. Stepped into the depth 
of your twisted psychological calamity, brought it right down into the grave and spit you right back out the other side. On the cross, Jesus was changing you. The cross was for you. The blood was for you. God didn't need changing. You needed changing. The Trinity has always been of one mind, of one will, of one heart. When he says, Father, not my will but yours be done, that's not a division in the will of the Trinity. That is the highest expression of the unity of the will of the Trinity. And he he has stepped down to show you his love. See, if all of a sudden we can't blame a twisted father for killing Jesus, because he makes us feel better about ourselves, because we hate people, we want a God who hates people, right? So it makes us feel better about ourselves. Because, I mean, ah, brother, I don't want you to go to hell. Just say this prayer with me. I mean, I, I don't want you to go to hell like he does. We think we're more moral than God. We think that we're a little more just and a little more righteous than he is. I mean, I wouldn't kill my own kid. I mean, how twisted is that? Even in our own twisted, fallen legal systems on planet Earth, this stuff wouldn't fly. Let's see, instead of killing you for what you did, I'm going to kill you for what he did. No, I'll just make it really perverted. I'll kill one of my own kids in a really brutal manner to show you how good I am. Absolutely twisted. We have been totally, radically tweaked out by this idea of some distant, aloof God, when in reality, he is the father of Jesus, and you have been brought into that Trinitarian life, into that father-son relationship, in the communal love of the Spirit. But if we can't blame the father for killing Jesus, well, who, who do we blame? And this is where the rubber hits the road. If the father didn't kill him, well, I'm not going to exactly tell you who killed Jesus, but I do have a few Bible verses that could possibly give you a little bit of an idea. You can make up your own mind of who killed Jesus. Uh, Luke 5, 28 through 30, and Nazareth, people wanted to throw him off a cliff. Matthew 12, 14, he healed someone on the Sabbath. People wanted to kill him. John 5, 16, he healed a lame man. They wanted to kill him. John 7, 19, 25, 30, and 44, they thought he might be the Christ, so they wanted to kill him. John 8, 37, 40, and 59, he claimed equality with God, so they wanted to kill him. John 10, 31 through 33 and 39, he was making himself be God, so they wanted to kill him. John 11, 45 through 57, many people were believing him, so they wanted to kill him. Finally, the Father did allow Jesus to fall into the hands of lawless men, but let's make it perfectly crystal clear here. John 10, 18, he says, No one takes my life from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This command I receive from my Father. What do you receive from the Father? The ability to lay his own life down. Now, somebody's going to say, Well, what about Isaiah 53? I mean, wasn't he pleased in the bruising of the Son? Yes, the father was absolutely pleased in the bruising of the son, not because he liked the torture and the hurt and all that, but in the bruising of the son, he saw the adoption of the nations. On the cross, we considered him stricken by God, but it wasn't God's wrath that put Jesus on the tree. It was our wrath that put Jesus on the tree. What Jesus is saying on the cross, he's quoting Psalm 22, verse 1, from his grandpappy David, where he says, my, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And this was actually a song of deliverance. And as you begin to read through Psalm, Psalm 22, you realize that he says, the Father has not disdained the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not turned his face from him. The Father never turned his back on the Son, just like the Father never turns his back on you. What was happening was that Jesus was stepping into our blindness to the love of God so that we could see. The Father loves you. The point here is that the cross was not just some legal exchange wrapped up in some courtroom system. The point of the cross was not wrath or law. The ultimate point of the cross was love. It is a full expression of the love of God. Unless he stepped in the depths of who we were and let us vent our rage on him, we would never be able to trust him to the depth that we do and see how absolutely for us he is. God has never been against you. He has always been for you. He loves you to bits, okay? Uh, again, grab my book, Cosmos Reborn. We go into it a lot more. Love you guys, and uh, check out these announcements. We'll see you next week. We just planned a last-minute tour across the USA for October. Gospel Lyrium is coming to four regions, Massachusetts, Ohio, Louisiana, and Colorado. 
Register online and come ready to throw down at www.thenewmystics.com slash tours. And another last minute edition for October, our Northwest Glory Symposium in Shelton, Washington. Register online. And visit thenewmystics.com slash schools to see our finalized calendar of mystical schools for the next year. John will be in New Jersey, September 12 to 14. St. Louis, October 17 to 19. Dublin Island, November 7 to 9. Brisbane, Australia, December 5 to 7. Woohoo! And Houston, Texas, January 2015. In February, he'll be in Liverpool, England, Reykjavik, Iceland, and Basel, Switzerland. In March 2015, he'll be in Las Vegas. And join us south of the border for our Mexico mission. We'll minister to thousands from around the country. It's our most affordable mission trip ever, and folks are already signing up, so lock in a spot early. 